probably 10 solutions, 10 counterexamples that greedy doesn't work, and about, I guess, yeah, about 10 people got five points extra towards their assignments. So, greedy, this type of greedy doesn't work. But how about now this greedy? Um, you always, you look for the largest pieces and you cut, you try to excise first the largest piece and first cut, uh, and you cut so that the largest piece is in the smaller of the two halves. And you keep doing that. Would this produce optimal solution? Probably not. But try to find a counterexample, and first 10 people get uh, five points towards assignments. I should have come up with this idea earlier because people got really excited. And, uh, uh, and the counterexample, the best one that I got for not cutting at the center, it's extremely elegant. So the piece is just uh, 10 meters long, and the cuts to be f done at five, uh, four, and six. Right? If you cut at five, the price is 10. Uh, then you have to cut here, which is another five, and another five here, so that's 10 together, so 20. But if you cut first here, that's 10, and then you cut here, that's six, and then only two more, so that's 18. Better than this. Uh, so it's really clean and very nice counterexample. But try to see. You will just investigate whether greedy, I doubt it would work, but one never knows. So I was thinking the reason why this works so well is that um, you don't want uh, to carry around long pieces without marks inside because they only contribute to the cost. So you want to kind of get rid as quickly as possible of uh, but I don't know if it will work. But what I like about, uh, I'm glad that I gave you this example because it stimulates people to uh, think about things. And some of you are already obviously completely computer scientists because I got solutions when people simply coded the greedy, coded the DP, used random number generator to put marks. And boop, it produced a solution counterexample with about 100 marks, but that's <laughs> so different ways to, to deal with problems. OK, so let's do a little bit more dynamic programming problems. And then hopefully next week we will do uh, max uh, flow and whatever is left. Uh, and then you will have really all the ideas that you need to solve all the problems on the final. So if you understand all the solutions uh, uh, that we did in class, you will be in good shape. Okay, so the problem is this. You are given uh, three strings of zeros and ones. So you have x that might look something like 1, 0, uh, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1. And then you have y that might look like this, uh, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, and so forth. And then sequence z might look something like this, 1, 1, 0. And so, and we say that z is, an interleaving of x and y, if you can build z, but by taking from left to right the bits of x and y in any order, right? So for example, here, I can start with this one, put it here, then take this one, put it here, then take this zero, put it here, and so forth, right? Uh, so the question is, determine whether x and y can be interleaved to produce z. And the reason why I'm showing you this problem is because it was a couple of years, it was several times on the final, and uh, people do always 
the following mistake. It's kind of uh, tempting uh, to just try to see how it would work and to try to do it from left to right. So I would get the solutions that would be started with Y, put as many digits as you can, then switch to X, go as long as you go, and so forth. Right? But this definitely doesn't work. Because if you take these two first ones and you use them to create these two ones, you are stuck <laughs> with two sequences that both have only ones and you cannot continue. Right? But if you instead take one from here, one from here, then you are, this zero becomes available. So dynamic programming is a recursion. So it is always good to think kind of backwards, right, from the end. Assuming that you succeeded up to a certain point, how would you continue, right? And uh, what do you think in such circumstances, what would be the sub-problems here to solve recursively? Can you skip some of the characters? No, you have to. Uh, you have to always peel the leftmost bit of either X or Y, but you can switch between the two in any order, right? So you cannot skip characters, just switch uh, between the two sequences. So what would be the good sub-problems here? Suffixes. Suffixes. So uh, the sub-problem... Uh, P, I, J will be, uh, can you interleave uh, X from 1 to um, I and Y from 1 to J? Uh, to obtain z1 to i plus j, of course, because, right? So this is the problem pi. And notice, once you get the right sub-problems, things become, recursion becomes usually completely obvious, transparent. So, uh, let's, we will build a table. Um, that will be of size, uh, uh, length, uh, let's call it length of uh, uh, X by length of Y, and the uh, cell, or maybe it's better the other way around. Lent, uh, so this will be lent x, lent y. And then in the cell uh, ij, you will have true or false. Right? And let's see how we can recursively fill the table. So when will, so let's call this uh, answer, right? Answer A of I, J, uh, which belongs to true, false. Uh, we, we build, we can define as follows. When is A of I, J equal to true? When would uh, a of i, j, so when will interleaving of x up to and including point i with interleaving y up to j, when will it be true? What do you have to look at now? Right, so if z of I uh, plus j, uh, z from 
1 to i plus j um, is equal to, okay, so let's, you know, it, the tables are kind of easy to uh, mess up, so uh, let's list, uh, just to make sure that we are not missing cases, so you can say, uh, uh, so it is true if, uh, say, z of uh, i plus j is equal, uh, so uh, if, when is it false? Exactly, if zij is not equal to uh, xi and uh, not equal uh, zij is zi plus j uh, not equal to yj, then clearly the result must be false, right? Simply because the very last uh, element of the interleaving, right, if you have your two uh, sequences uh, and uh, your sequence z, uh, and this is the bit uh, i plus j bit, if this bit doesn't match, it, if it neither matches this bit of y nor that bit of x, of course, the answer must be false. Right? Um, right? So now we have to see um, when else it is false. What about if z of ij is equal to uh, x of i and uh, uh, z, oops, sorry, I keep putting ij, it's i plus j, right? i plus j is uh, not equal to uh, yj. Uh, then when will this be false if this is true and this is not equal? So you see, if uh, z i plus j is not, so this is your x, this is y. If it's not equal to this guy, but it is equal to that guy, then it will be false only, if and only if what happens? Uh, exactly, if a of, uh, let's see, i minus 1 j is equal to false. Uh, because the only way uh, to interleave would be to map this to this, but then, of course, this will not be of no help if uh, the answer for this pair, when you drop uh, y is equal, to, uh, if, if it's equal to false. Um, so what case is left? Similarly, you will have a case if z of ij is equal to yj, right? And it is not equal to, um, to xi. You will have exactly the same clause, but here it will be a uh, i j minus 1 equal to false. And finally, uh, if uh, z of i plus 1, of i plus j, is equal to xi and it is equal to yj, when will the answer be false? So now this end element matches both, but the answer will be fail, right? Because if either if you match it here, the answer to the previous problem is false, and if you map it here, the answer will be also false. So in this case, uh, um, uh, um, uh, you will have and uh, a of uh, i minus 1 j 
is false and A of uh, I j minus 1 is false. And in other cases, of course, this will be true. And you could have done it the other way, examining the cases uh, when it will be true. Right? So it's essentially an exhaustive search, but only at the recursion step. We look at the very last element, and we now simply check, can this last element be obtained from here? Or can this last element be obtained from here? If both are equal, if this is say one, one, and this is one, then the answer will be true if in at least one of the two cases, if you map this to this, and then the answer for the interleaving of the rest is true, and vice versa. And of course, um, uh, if, uh, if uh, it doesn't match in uh, either of the cases, in both of the cases, then the answer will be false. So you see, if you do it from the back, recursion, if you find the right subproblems, Recursion becomes simple, and very often it is just brute force. Because here, the recursion step is brute force search, right? You try, okay, can this come from here? Failure. Well, can it come from here? If it can come from here in the sense that if you map this to this, then the rest of this plus this whole thing can be interleaved to the rest of this, right? So, but notice because we do it recursively, um, it is not overall a brute uh, force search um, because obviously this algorithm is quadratic because in all of the cases in the table, what are the cells that we had to check? Where are the cells that recursion, that this re recursion refers to? Mm -hmm. It's just this one, in case you map to the uh, last element of y, and it's this one, right? So it's obviously in constant time because recursion step only looks at these two cells and puts the value here accordingly. So never try to do it kind of uh, from the front end, the recursion, right, always extends. Okay, let's do another example that looks like brute force, but it is not. So I'll simplify, the problem is on the list, but I'll simplify it. Assume that you have N1, many objects of size S1, and N2, many objects of size S2. And you have boxes of capacity C. You have to pack all of the objects, n1 plus n2, many objects, in as few boxes as possible. Well, it's not quite a knapsack, but it kind of shares the kind of the flavor. Um, right, because it's very tempting if you did really knapsack each time, it won't work. So the idea to try to stuff as much things in the boxes, in each box, does not work because then you change the ratio between the boxes and you might end up with... Um, uh, uh, you, may, you may end up with uh, extra boxes. So the point is, don't try to optimally fill each box. The way to do it is, again, dynamic programming. Because you see, finite, you know, finiteness is kind of really a straight jacket. Uh, if the size is S1 and S2, depending how they relate to each other, uh, it can really change um, uh, the, the ratios between N1 and N2 can make a big difference how many boxes you need. So how would, what will be the sub 
problems here. Exactly. So the sub problems, uh, sub problems will be problem i j is uh, find the minimal number of boxes. Now this might look that this is an overkill, but if I made the number of objects also a parameter, say if I have nk boxes of size sk, then this becomes np, NP hard problem. So this is actually a tough one, even though it looks kind of naive. So find minimal number of boxes to pack um, i objects of uh, size S1 and, and J objects of size, uh, uh, size um, uh, S2, right? So again, will be a two-dimensional table. And you want to fill this cell. Now, unlike the previous problem, the solution will involve looking, looking back to many previous solutions. With this hint, how would you find the optimal solution for uh, i many of size S1 and j many of size S2 by recursion? Yeah. So I can see why you want to try every number of S1 that you can get in the <coughs> box, but having decided how many S1 to put into the box, would it not always be optimal to put as many S2 into the box as will fit? Uh, yes, that's exactly right. So, um, uh, so I did not say that uh, you should leave uh, uh, C. You can, so uh, idea would be, it is not one idea would be to range, of course, you will put certain number of boxes of S1, and then you fill up with as many as S2. But what you don't do is not, you try all possible combinations and pick the one that in total is the largest, yeah. right? Because <coughs> this may change uh, uh, the ratio between N1 and N2. So, Following your idea, how would you solve this problem? I'm just thinking, it's just there, it says like minimal number of boxes to pack I of size S1 and J of S2, but having decided on the number of S1, then you're only going to try one number of S2, namely the maximum it will fit. Yep, so the recursion is, you simply do the following. You take one box and you fill it with objects of size S2, as many as you can put, and then you look in the cell, say you can put uh, K many objects, K1 many objects of size uh, uh, S2, then you will look here, uh, S1 didn't change, so the cell will be somewhere here, and here will be, um, J minus K1. So you fill one box with K many objects of size S1. So now you have, uh, sorry, of size S2. So now you have J many K1 objects and you look what's the optimal packaging in this cell. Then you put one piece of size S1, fill as much as you can with S2, and look up in the cell that is I minus one, and here it will be some J minus K2. And you look what is the optimal solution here. And you do this with as many 
um, maybe the top maximal number of, uh, of objects of size M1 is M1 that uh, can fit in the box. Again, you see if you can add objects of uh, size S2. And then among all these solutions, you pick the smallest one and add one box. So notice here the recursion step is brute force. You simply say, OK, I have to use minimal number of boxes. Take one box, fill it all with objects of size S2. Then look in the previous recursively obtained solution for uh, J many minus, say, you, you manage to put K1 many objects of size S2, right? Then look how many boxes do you need for the equal number of I's, because you didn't put any, and J minus K1 many uh, objects of size uh, S2, and see how many boxes I need. Then you empty the box. Now you put one object of size S1, fill the box with as many objects of size S2 as you can, and again, look at the optimal solution. Now I will drop for one. J will drop for some number K2, right? As many objects as you can put of size S2 if you include one object of size S1. Look at the optimal solution. Finally, put as many objects of size S1 as you can. See if you can add any objects of S2. And look how many objects, how many boxes it takes. Then you take mean of this and add one box that you just filled. So notice this looks like a brute force. But it's, so to speak, short brute force because the box is, the size of the box is fixed. So you can compute what is C divided by S1 and what is C divided by S2. And you know that uh, you will, if this is the, um, say this, you don't need even this. You compute how many, this will tell you how many objects of size S1 can fit in the box, say M of them. So, and M is a constant independent of N1 and N2. It depends only of the sizes of the objects and the capacity of the box. So this can be arbitrarily large. So in terms of n's, right, it will, um, this will be in constant, uh, constant many um, trials to see how, right, uh, choices how to fill a box independent on N1 and N2, and the size of the table is uh, N1 times N2, so it's quadratic in the number of objects and constant factor with respect to C and sizes. So that's important uh, uh, to understand that uh, making it Brooks, you see, that's the whole point of dynamic programming and in recursion in general, um, the recursion step can be brute force and trivial, but resulting re recursion can be extremely powerful. I gave you this uh, uh, example with Howard's of Thai Hanoi, right? If you try to do it, it's extremely hard, but thinking recursively it's, the problem is completely trivial. How? So look how recursion makes towers of, so you have these three poles, right? And on one of them you have all of these uh, uh, disks, right? And you have to move disks from here to say here. But you cannot put larger disk on top on a, of a smaller disk. It's a nightmare if you try to do it, but recursion is trivial. How? You simply solve the problem with one disk less. 
but you move them here. How do you do it? I don't know, recursively. You just call the, call the subroutine. Say, so your subroutine, it will be move uh, n, n minus one many rings from one to three. How? I have no clue, but this is smaller, so the machine will know how to do it, right? Once you move the large disk, uh, sorry, the, once you move the n minus one disks here, right, when your uh, subroutine exits, you simply take the last disk and put it here. And then you call the very same procedure that moves the disks from here to here. So it's trivial, right? But resulting shuffling is just mind-boggling if you try to do it by yourself, okay? So it's the same here in dynamic programming. So the recursion step is, uh, is uh, trivial, brute force search. But resulting recursion is re resulting routine is not trivial at all. Okay. Um, I've almost forgot. I want to give you hints about the homework, uh, about this square root n memory. So you have to solve this uh, standard dynamic programming problem. You start with this cell, and you can only move down and to the right, and you want to end up in this cell, and you have numbers in all these cells, and you want to pick up along the way the largest score, right, sum total. And this is trivial. To fill the table, you simply look. You solve optimal problem. What is the highest score that I can get starting from this point and ending here? Well, to end here, there are only two ways, from here or from here. So you simply see what's the largest score that you can get coming here. The largest score that you can get coming here. You take the max. If this one, then this is uh, a max of these two, and you add the score on this cell, and that's your optimum here. right? But in order to retrace the path, it becomes tricky. You need to keep the pointers from which direction you came all along, right? Because you, once you come here, you don't know where you exactly came. And you want to do it with the square n times square root n memory, right? And the idea is the following. You take square root n many checkpoints. So you will take square root n many uh, rows, right? So the distance here will be square root n, and there will be square root n, uh, square root n many of them. So in total, this is exactly n by n, right? So you see what I mean, right? So the trick now is the following. You start running your standard algorithm, right? Um, obviously, all what we need is only the previous line to go to the next line, right? So, um, you keep running your algorithm until uh, you reach uh, this line and you keep only this piece of the whole table, right? Now, for every cell, you can backtrack and see for that cell, from which cell your optimal path to this came from. And you can keep a pointer that tells you for each cell from where you got. Now you can erase this 
And in space, what is this space? This is exactly square root n times n. And you keep doing this in uh, layers, right? Each time, in each layer, you have a pointer when you where you came from, OK? And eventually, you end up here. Now what you can do, you can backtrack. You cannot, rec you cannot recover the, the exact path. But you can tell, ah, here I came from here. Here I came from here. So you can find for the optimal path, what were the square root n many intermediate. Now you can rerun your whole algorithm from the beginning. But you now keep track only in each bit here. You will memorize late only the path that led you to here, and you go down. So work it out. Uh, this should. There is an amazingly clever solution that does this in space O of n. And it's just mind-boggling, but we don't have much time. So let's do, I wanted to give you a hint how to solve the Cheryl Rides problem by showing you how to solve the famous Turtle Tower problem, which you have solved in the, oh, if there are additional like lecture notes on the website with the solution of uh, maximum variation sequence and, uh, or minimum variation, whatever was it, and uh, t turtle towers. So you are given a bunch of turtles, uh, right? And they all have certain strength and certain weight, right? And you have to build the highest possible, as many turtles as you can, so that uh, the no turtle would crack. And the turtle will not crack if the total weight of turtles above it is smaller than its strength. Now, this is an excellent problem because it shows very kind of powerfully the steps of dynamic programming. First of all, these turtles are in any order. And you want to build towers, obviously, by extending shorter towers with uh, more turtles. But you, if you, if you, have to, you have to recurse. So somehow you have to make sure that the best towers can always be built uh, only from the preceding turtles. You see, if you order the turtles and you try to build towers by extension, Maybe you miss the optimal solution because in some of the, uh, in the optimal solution, this guy happens to be, uh, to appear early. And if you do the building of the towers in this, um, in this order, of course you will miss it because if you build out of these turtles, every turtle in the tower also precedes uh, the previous turtle in that tower in this order. So you have to find an ordering of turtles that guarantees that if you recurse along that ordering, you will not miss an optimal solution. And for this, you have to do a little bit of mathematics to show. And the idea is, as the hint says, order turtles according to the total sum of their strength plus weight. So now, in order to show that recursion will not skip optimal solution, we have to show that if there is a tower of height n, uh, then there is a tower of height n in which uh, turtles are in increasing 
order of uh, strength plus weight. Right? So if there is a tower that contains n turtles, uh, then definitely there is a tower of the same height in which the ordering of the turtles, the or turtles are in increasing order of height of um, weight plus strength. This guarantees that if you recurse along ordering of turtles of strength plus weight, you will not miss optimal solution. Because if there is a perturbed solution in which the turtles are not in that ordering, this will guarantee that there is also one with the same. In fact, we, can, we will show that the very same tower can be permuted in the increasing order without turtles cracking. In order to do that, we apply the same, yes? Why strength plus weight and not weight over strength? You will see right now. That's the trick that's, well, okay, look. The, the, uh, uh, what I'm showing you are, if you come to extended class um, right after this, you will see a reduction that is mind-boggling that was in the CARP's original paper of 21 NP complete problems. And the device that he uses is just how the hell did he think of it? Huh? Well, what can I tell you? Probably um, Dick CARP is just a bloody smart, right? Now, why in this order? When you try to find the recursion, you try them in increasing weight, and you get stuck. Then you try in increasing strength, you get stuck. And then you think, what else can I use? What I'm trying to say, when you see enough examples, you get a feeling and uh, uh, what to try. But Algorithms so design is kind of equally art as it's sort of science. You simply develop a gut feeling. It's like playing chess, right? You have to practice it, right? And if you ask, you know, or they asked Yasha Heifetz, the famous violinist, how he plays. And he tried to show them. And he lost ability after that to play for a month. I mean, what I'm saying, or I'll tell you a really crazy story. Okay, so my advisor, oh gosh, we don't have time. For, okay, I'll tell you. My advisor, my advisor, Jack Silver, he was an extremely famous set theorist. By the way, in his lifetime, he published only seven papers, which would, here, he would be fired before you blink. <laughs> But these seven papers solve problems that some of them were open from Cantor's time in the mid-19th century. And it was really hard to work with him because each time after seeing him, I would think, why the heck am I doing mathematics, right? Because so once, uh, you know, I showed him a paper written by a famous mathematician. He, he asked me what I was doing. I was trying to read this paper. He says, okay, give me the paper. And he reads this paper. And within five minutes, he comes up with a solution with, which obliterates the paper. And I was absolutely stunned. And I asked him, how did you do that? And he said, did what? <laughs> and uh, I said, well, how did you come up with this? He said, I don't know. I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the trick is, but Jack spent lots of time playing with said theory, and he developed what's called gut feeling. If you ask him how he did it, he couldn't tell you. But you get the skill, right? It's the same in sports, you know, these people, you know, that can hit the basket with a basketball from the other side. You have, you know, you develop eventually abilities. So it's the same here if you solve a bunch of problems. You pick up the tricks, and the, these tricks kind of ferment in your head. And eventually, they come as your gut feeling what to do, right? Um, and if nothing works, you can always have a beer, <laughs> right? So why is this true? Well, we will show that uh, 
Uh, if there is an inversion, you can flip it without changing, uh, without <coughs> causing turtles to break. If I flip these two guys, this guy certainly will not break because he will see fewer turtles. So you only have to show that this guy will not break. And this is done by simple calculation. Do it in, uh, I'll read it in the paper. We have to kind of speed up. But what I want to tell you is this. Now, you might want to build a turtle tower by simply looking what's optimal that you got. So you solve the problem, build turtle tower from first eye turtles in this order. And you can see, well, maybe I look at the previous optimal tower. Uh, maybe if I can extend it, I add this turtle to the tower. Otherwise, I don't. Well, the problem is that the turtle tower, that the optimal turtle tower might be too heavy for this turtle. But um, you can put something suboptimal, which will later allow you to extend it. So how this is solved is, for each stage of recursion, you build all possible towers of, of I mean, you build towers of all possible heights, which are lightest for that number of turtles. Now, if you can extend uh, uh, a tower with your turtle, clearly you can extend the lightest. And this is what allows the recursion. It's explained in detail in the paper. In the Cheryl's ride, uh, rides, uh, a hint is uh, try for um, every sub, uh, you order the rides according to this uh, deposit fee, and then you, for, you do the following. For, our, for every I, look what is the collection of I cheapest rides uh, that she can afford. Because if you can extend a set of affordable ones, you can always extend the cheapest one. So I introduce another parameter. So you will be choosing among first I many uh, which ones she should take. For every, for every integer k between 1 and at most i, uh, but for each set you choose ones that are the lightest. And this will allow you to recurse, right? So give it a try with that. So dynamic programming is tricky and very, but it's also very powerful. And this is why we are spending, we will do a few more problems next uh, week and then we will do max flow and uh, then, uh, uh, then you will be on your own to study. Eh?